and well. Welcome to the next talk in our Golden Webinars in Astrophysics series. Our speaker today is Bill Press, who is Professor in Computer Science and Integrative Biology at the University of Texas in Austin. My name is Thomas Puzia, and together with my new co-hosts, Elizabeth Artur de la Villamoire and Demetra de Chico, we have organized today's webinar for you. As in our previous webinars, we have arranged for simultaneous language interpretation provided by Patricio Gonzalez, who will be simultaneously translating for us again into Spanish. En sus dispositivos pueden escuchar la interpretación al español de la conferencia al pinchar el botón de interpretación que se encuentra en la parte inferior derecha de la ventana de la aplicación Zoom y seleccionar español. We would like to acknowledge the generous support of the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish acronym, to make this series possible. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for all your uh, feedbacks and comments. If you're watching a record of this talk in YouTube, please leave your comments below. If you would like to support the Golden Webinar series or give us feedback, please send us an email. If you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the Q&A window. You can also upload questions and comment on them. We will select the best questions for the discussion after the talk. Before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce our other me uh, panel members that are with us today. We have uh, Bill Press, our speaker, uh, Patricia Gonzalez, our interpreter, Thomas Puzia, Demetra de Checo, and myself as uh, organizers uh, from the faculty at the Institute of Astrophysics uh, at PUC. We have uh, Patricia Tisera. We also have uh, our postdoc, Giuseppe Dago. We also have the great pleasure to welcome our guest panelists today, Ivo Savian, 
astronomer and site manager at the European Southern Observatory at La Silla. Conrad Tristram, astronomer at the European Southern Observatory at Cerro Paranal. Bryce Menard, professor of astrophysics, John Hopkins University and Bob Williams, Director Emeritus and Research Scholar at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And finally, we have our Q&A manager, Ricardo Acevedo. It is our great pleasure to introduce William H. Press as our speaker today. Bill obtained his PhD in physics in 1972 from the California Institute of Technology. After that, he was Stormer Research Fellow in Theoretical Physics and then also Assistant Professor Theoretical Tech for the following few years. Then assistant professor in physics at Princeton University from 1974 to 1976, when he became professor of astronomy and physics at Harvard University, being Harvard's youngest senior professor at that time. Together with Saul Tiokowski, he established the dynamic stability of rotating black holes. Press is best known for the eponymous press sector formalism, which predicts the distribution of masses of galaxies in the universe, which he co-discovered with Paul Schechter. His work with Adam Rees and Robert Kirchner led to the calibration of distant supernovae as standard candles, which is the foundation for the subsequent discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe. He left Harvard in 1998 to become Deputy Laboratory Director for Science and Technology at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where he is currently a Senior Fellow Emeritus. Bill is also senior author, author of the numerical recipes textbooks on scientific computing. And during his career as a researcher, he published more than 160 papers spanning theoretical astrophysics and cosmology, as well as computational biology and algorithms. From 2009 to 2017, he was a member of President Obama Council, Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. He's currently a member of many associations, such as the American Association for the Advancement of Science, of which he was also president, the governing board of the National Research Council, the National Academy of Sciences, where in 2000, he also founded the Computer and Information Science section. He has been treasurer there for the past four years, and that is when his broad interest extended to computational finance and financial engineering. And so today, Bill will tell us about a quick dive into computational finance. Bill. Thank you, Thomas and Dimitra and Elizabeth for that very kind introduction. Um, I'll now share my screen. Oh, good. Um, so um, this isn't an astrophysics talk, which is a little bit odd in this series, although uh, I guess in, in my lifetime I've done some astrophysics. So I have some idea how to talk to astrophysicists, even uh, if the subject is not about astrophysics. But I do owe you an explanation of, of how I came to this subject. Um, um, about four years ago, Unexpectedly, I became the elected treasurer of the US National Academy of Sciences, which has an endowment of $500 million and uses the uh, income from that to support some of its activities. Um, I'm not able to get a hold of that money personally myself, um, but I am responsible for um, seeing how it's invested. Uh, not just by myself. The National Academy um, has a committee that includes uh, Nobel Prize winners in economics uh, and hedge fund pioneer uh, Jim Simons. Uh, so, um, you know, I was familiar with the idea of astrophysicists very early in their career leaving astrophysics uh, for Wall Street or for the world of finance. In my case, this happened quite late in my career, but it seemed like a good opportunity to learn some things. I look back in history at what other treasurers of the National Academy of Sciences have done. And here we go back to the year 1898. And the treasurer was someone that uh, I've never heard of. I doubt that you've ever heard of it. I'm moving my mouse around some Professor Billings here. And you can see here that the investments of the National Academy of Sciences, which totaled about, looks like maybe $10,000 at that time, 
and they were invested in um, District of Columbia bonds, that is Washington DC's uh, governing district, and then loans to specific people or institutions here in which they loaned money at these percents of interest, including two sisters of the visitation, a charitable group. Uh, but the world has become a lot more complicated since 1898. Um, and so, uh, I, I had to learn a lot more from, from my uh, colleagues on the Investments Committee of the Academy. Now, let me present this kind of pseudo-mathematically. We'll get to some real mathematically in a minute. Um, let me tell you it, in succession two axioms, and then I'm going to prove a theorem from those axioms. And it's a surprising theorem. So my first axiom or, or postulate or proposition is that in the long run, investments make money. Now, how do we know that? Well, like all investments, you know, you're allowed to know things about the past and you're trying to infer things about the future. So here I'm showing you 120 years of past up to not quite the present. Um, this data comes from a famous economist, uh, Schiller, and I'm showing you in orange, that's the important curve to look at first. Orange is the um, growth in um, value on a log scale of an investment in the United States stock market, uh, a particular index called the uh, Standard & Poor's or S&P 500. Uh, I guess at this point, I need to apologize to the international audience for giving a rather US centric talk in terms of finance. Um, most of my statistics are going to come from the US stock market, which is actually only about less, less than half, something like a third of the world's stock market. Uh, and my denomination of currency is going to be dollars. So uh, I apologize for this uh, parochial view. Um, in any case, you see that, that as we like to say to astrophysical approximation, the S&P 500 has grown exponentially over time. And this is real growth. Inflation has been factored out here. Now, um, what are some of these other curves? You might just think, well, of course, the value of the total stock market will grow. Um, the value of an investment will grow because the economy grows. The gross domestic product here has grown. Um, and the blue curve is the gross domestic product of the United States, um, but I fitted to a fitted multiple of it. And you can see that, that um, investments have increased in value um, faster than the GDP. In fact, uh, on a log scale, it has a slope of almost two. Okay, so it's not simply that you own a share of the economy and that share increases in value. Um, there's actually a value. Uh, you, you actually make money in the long run on stock. And there are various other ways of, of fitting it shown here. Now, in the inset, I want to remind you that um, this is only over the long run. And in fact, there are a number of periods of a decade or longer in which you don't make money invested in the stock market. If you had invested in the year 2000, right before the um, crash at that time, that's called the dot-com crash because it was led by uh, internet companies with no zero revenues and zero prospects, as it turned out. Um, you see, you wouldn't have recovered your value in real dollars until uh, 2014 here. You can see that similarly here I am in the Great Depression starting at the peak of 1929, and you would not have recovered your value until um, the mid 1940s. So in the long run, and then when I say on average up at the top, the footnote is that that is to say in expectation value in the technical sense, that is to say um, your mean expected value statistically, not necessarily what any one instantiation is going to do. So those are all important caveats. Okay, my next axiom or widely held belief is 
it's widely believed that if you have some money, you can put it into something at zero risk, or again, to astrophysical accuracy, so close to zero risk that we might call it um, zero risk. And uh, in the United States, but also worldwide, the, the closest um, thing to an example of that are US Treasury three-month Treasury bills. Um, so zero risk, and most of the time with some return. Here's the annualized return. This is not corrected for inflation, by the way. Um, but um, it's been only very recently in the last decade or so that zero risk returns have been very close to zero. So zero risk, zero return has been the last decade's experience. Now, is this assumption really, really true? Again, um, we use historical data about the past and we infer or assume future behavior, which is always dangerous. Um, in fact, there are some countries that challenge this in which the zero risk rates of return are negative. Uh, I think, um, I haven't looked recently, but Germany, Switzerland have been in that position. What that means is you have to pay people to take your money and hold on to it and then give it back to you after some period of time. Um, you might think you can just hold it in cash, but many countries have laws against holding or exchanging large amounts of cash. So um, the, uh, the government, if you live in a country with negative return and the laws say that you can't hold cash, you're just stuck with that negative zero risk return. Okay, that's still the exception to the rule. The rule is you can get at least zero return with zero risk. So those are my two axioms. And now let me prove a theorem to you it's not very hard to prove, but it might pr show you that financial engineering, as this field is usually called, has a, a little bit of content to it. So I'm going to have to define some stuff. Um, the idea is we're going to hold a portfolio. We're going to take our money, the National Academy's uh, endowment, and we're going to hold just two things. We're going to put a fraction F0 of that portfolio into this risk-free investment. And then the remaining fraction, one minus F0, we're going to put, so that's fraction into standard and poor's, we're going to put that into the S&P 500. That is to say, into an index fund of the US stock market. Now, uh, we need two numbers, which are the risk-free, we need the risk-free return, R0, and this can vary with time. So this is a time series indexed by I. I might be the year number or the, the month number, month number after 1900 or something. Um, and there's also a return from the stock market, which can vary even more in time because sometimes that's positive, sometimes that's negative in any given month. But we can compute, therefore, in any given I, any given time interval, that our return is just the weighted average of the risk-free return times its fraction and the stock return times its fraction. And I'll just rewrite that algebraically in um, this, where I uh, um, have a term that's multiplied by, by F0, the fraction in the risk-free investment, and this difference of interest rates. Okay, now, why did I emphasize expectation value before? Because I'm going to take the expectation value of this equation in the statistical sense. So I guess for an astronomer audience, you might have been more familiar if I put um, angle brackets instead of a big bold E, um, but uh, maybe you're familiar with a big bold E means expectation value or average value in the average statistical value. Okay, um, let's put some numbers in. Um, historically, a reasonable number for the stock market is something like six or 7% for the US stock market. And a reasonable number for the risk-free investment is much smaller. Let's say it's half a percent. Um, in the US now, it's about a 10th of a percent or something, but as I say, that's unusual. Okay. And now I'm going to do something that you didn't expect. Let's choose F0 to be large and negative. 
Well, how can I do that? Because it's a fraction of my portfolio. So you thought that it had to be between zero and one. But financial engineers are amazing people. F0 can be negative if you, instead of investing money at the zero risk rate, if you borrow money at the zero risk rate and you use that borrowed money to buy stock shares in the S&P 500, okay? And that's called leveraging, using borrowed money to buy stock or some other investment. Um, now, R0 is now no longer exactly the uh, uh, um, risk-free investment return. It's actually, it's a uh, mirror image. It's the um, fully collateralized borrowing rate. In other words, you're gonna borrow this money from people. Um, why are they gonna loan you money? Well, because you're gonna let them hold on to your stock as collateral, meaning that at any given time, if they think you're going to default on the loan, they've got your stock and they can sell it off on their own to repay the loan. Okay, so they give you a very low interest rate. In fact, banks will give you a rate not too much higher than the uh, um, uh, zero risk return on investment. Okay, um, and now you see you can make an infinite amount of money because um, this large and negative and this difference is positive and that surely, well, this is positive anyway. So you can make as much money as you want, infinity. And that's the end of the theorem. Well, you probably doubt that you can really go out and do this and you're right. But what this theorem shows you is that investing is not actually about the expectation value of your return. It's actually about controlling your risk, your var the variance of your return or the variance of your portfolio value uh, or a technical term is volatility, which is the standard deviation of how much up and down it goes in, in, in a given year. Okay, so we're gonna take that lesson and go forward with it. Now, since we're dealing with variance, we'd better learn something about how the value of investments like stocks vary day to day. And of course, there's lots of data on this. So here's 50 years, I think that's the number, of uh, daily changes in the S&P 500. And I've shown you a histogram of how much they change. So in a typical day, um, you see this is in 2%, 4%, but you can see a typical day, it's plus or minus 1%. Well, you wouldn't make any money in the long run if this was an exactly symmetrical curve. And in fact, um, this curve has a mean of, um, 0.042%, so that's not 4%, that's four hundredths of a percent per day. And if you multiply that by, you probably think 365, but there are only about 250 stock trading days in the year. So if you multiply by that, you should get something like the typical rate of return of the S&P 500. Now, in my title here, I've said roughly Gaussian. If you stare at this, you can see, astronomers well know, this doesn't look very Gaussian. In fact, it looks somewhat more peaked and somewhat more long-tailed. Um, so that's something I'm going to come back to. But you'll see this has a lot of properties that are Gaussian, even if the distribution doesn't look Gaussian. And here, little day-to-day -day correlation. In other words, you might decide that you're gonna buy a stock because it went up a lot today, so it'll probably go up a lot tomorrow. Well, that just ain't so in the historical record. Um, so each dot represents, it's now a month. So this is sort of 50 years of months. There probably are about 500 dots. And you can see that if we um, have a positive return in month I, and ask what is the return in month I plus one, it's very slightly correlated. In fact, the, the fraction of variance explained by that correlation is 7%. So 93% of the variance has no correlation month to month. 
okay? In fact, it's questionable whether even this positive correlation is real because um, it, it could be that um, some of the underlying companies are not using exactly the same month intervals. In other words, if they're lagging a little bit in their reporting, they can't be leading in their reporting because that would take a time machine, right? If they're slow in reporting, then that would show up as a false month to month correlation that might even be of this order. Uncorrelated over disjoint time periods. So now let's let's actually do a little calculation, a little useful calculation that that astronomers will understand as a signal to noise calculation. Let's suppose we buy some US stock market and we hold it for n units of time. So could be months, could be years, but let, let's just keep it general. So that says that our expected return will be n times the mean return per unit of, of whatever unit of time we're using. And let's try to get what astronomers would call a one sigma detection that we're getting any positive return at all, right? Let's try to prove to ourselves that you can make money in the stock market at all. So here is the expected return. And in terms of the standard deviation, um, the standard deviation would increase as the square root of the number of periods of time. Again, familiar law, I hope, to astronomers, astrophysicists. So a one sigma detection says that n times mu is greater than the square root of n times sigma. You can rewrite that as n, the length of time, must be greater than sigma over mu squared. And if you do dimensional analysis, OK, you'll find that this all works out because n is dimensionless. It's a number of units of time. Sigma and mu have the same have the same dimensions. Well, you can put in numbers from these two plots, and you'll get 780 days, or about three years, three trading years. It's 250 days or so per year. Okay, that says that if you buy the stock market today, on average, you'll have to wait three years before you even know whether you're making or losing money. Well, of course you'll know. You'll just see the value going up or down. No, I don't mean that. I mean knowing with statistical significance whether you're making or losing money. Okay. So, so by the way, when you turn on the TV every night and they tell you how the stocks went up today or down today or this month or quarterly earnings, you should take that with a a uh, great deal of skepticism, because in most cases, they are reporting noise, not signal. And it's only on timescales of, let's just roughly say, a year or longer and more like three years or longer that you really get to learn with any signal to noise ratio what's going on. OK, well, this is well known in the mathematical investment community, and they have a name for this. Uh, <clears throat> the return divided by the standard deviation. So I've changed notation here because here that was called mu. Um, and they're even a little bit smarter than that. They subtract off the risk-free return, although right now that would be close to zero. And that has a name that's called the Sharpe ratio, um, named after an economist who won the Nobel Prize for this and some other related things. So what we've learned here is that the inverse square of the Sharpe ratio is the number of years it takes um, to have a one sigma detection of a uh, profitable investment. OK, let's, let's go back to that, um, um, or I should say, let's launch from that graph showing the, uh, I'll go back to it, from this graph showing that there um, is little correlation from day to day and see what we can learn um, advancing that. Well, if the changes in the value are IID, as the statisticians say, that is independent and identically distributed as a statistical distribution. If they're IID, then the variance of the price change should grow linearly with the interval. That's just the statement that if you have independent variables, the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances, okay? 
you can either you know that or you can go off and prove that. That's of course for for independent quantities. Um, variance is additive, but we can test that with the stock market data. So here I've plotted the square root of the variance, that is to say the standard deviation of returns over intervals of different length, over three orders of magnitude difference, ranging from one day to, um, looks like about uh, 2000 days, which must be about six years or more, okay? So this is probably 50 years of data. And if you get much more than six years, you don't have enough independent samples to make the measurement. And here I've just plotted a slope of 0.5. Now, slope of 0.5 is the same as if you square standard deviation variance, a slope of one. Or you could say this is just the square root law that when you add independent quantities, the standard deviation increases as the square root of, of time. Okay, and the data is just amazingly close to that. I mean, in astronomy, we never see data that good, do we? Or maybe, maybe helioseismology. Uh, I don't know. Are there other very pre high precision uh, fields of of, of astronomy? Um, okay, so um, now. What, what should we have found? If the blue line, which is the data, had a slope steeper than 0 0.5, that would say that prices are persistent. That would say that on average, um, if, you, if something was going up for a while, it would continue to go up. In other words, the variance increases um, uh, more than a random walk, maybe is another way of saying it. Um, and similarly, a slope of less than 0.5 would mean um, a, a price reverting to the mean. In other words, if it goes up, it tends to go down. And you can see that stocks are delicately poised, um, but robustly poised between those two. Namely, they are very, very close to a, a random walk. OK, incidentally, um, because of this fact that it's so close to 0.5, that means that if we measure um, the behavior of, say, any single stock using an interval of days, and we might do that um, be because we'll then get a lot of independent measurements, OK? In fact, the professional hedge funds measure the performance of stocks and investments minute by minute. And then you can extrapolate using this curve, not to find whether it's going to go up or down, because this the slope of 0.5 says you can't do that. But you can extrapolate to get a reasonable expectation of what the variance is going to be on longer periods of time. OK, and it's conventional to annualize the standard deviation. So when you read um, that a stock has an annual volatility of such and such a percent, that's actually not measured by having a whole sample of years. That's measured by having a whole sample of, let's say, days. OK, so these things taken together um, um, have a, a name. It's called FAMA's, uh, after the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, FAMA's Efficient Market Hypothesis, or EMH. And here is, I think it's the quote from Fama, but it's, it's from some economist in plain language, what that means. Stocks always trade at their fair value, making it impossible to either detect when a stock is overvalued or undervalued. So on average, you simply can't perform the overall market through expert stock selection or market timing. OK, the only way you can obtain higher returns is by the method that I showed you in my theorem, the very first theorem I proved, by accepting higher risk. You don't have to go all the way in that theorem of taking the limit to infinity and trying to get infinite return. You, you can just take a relatively riskier portfolio to increase your return. Now, this is sort of you know words for popular consumption. There's quite a precise mathematical formulation of this hypothesis. Um, what the statisticians and mathematicians would say is that um, stock prices are, I didn't write it all out here, are the sum of two terms. One of them is that 
slow, long-term gain in value that's been seen for 120 years. And day to day, what you see is what statisticians call a martingale. And a martingale is, if you're not familiar with the term, a statistical process where if you want to know what is the expectation value at time n plus 1, given all of the past history, a martingale has a, the, pro, the property that all of this past history is useless except the most recent value and the expectation value of the future is just the same as the current value. So roughly speaking, that's defining random walk, but this is the more precise definition of that. Okay, now um, martingale plus um, independent and identically distributed changes here, I'm just introducing you to some terminology that you may hear around. Um, the real purpose of my talk to astronomers is so that you have some great words to throw around at cocktail parties. Um, if we ever have cocktail parties again, post COVID. Um, and if you go to a cocktail party, and I don't know about you, but I've gone to a lot of cocktail parties with astronomers where all anybody talks about is their work. And here you'll be able to throw around these terms from uh, financial engineering. Okay, so throw around the term black shoals. Um, I, 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 I guess uh, for the translation, it's hard to make the pun, but black shoals does not refer to a dark coral reef I'm challenging the translator on that one. Um, it's the name of two p economists who won Nobel Prizes, okay. Um, and what that basically says is that stock prices do a random walk, not in dollar space, but in log dollar space. That the expected value of a stock after a time t is what it is at zero times something drawn from a log normal distribution whose mean, here's where you make your money, the return times the time, that's just what you expected. And here's the standard deviation, standard deviation times the square root of time. And I'm going to leave as a wonderful exercise for the reader, for the mathematically inclined listener, um, to figure out where this term came from. Well, I'll tell you where it comes from and then I'll let you derive it. Um, the, Expect if, if you have a log normal distribution um, that increases with time, the expectation value actually diverges to infinity because it spreads out with time and the tail is increasing exponentially fast. So to have it have a well-defined mean as it spreads out, you have to subtract this little term from your return. Okay, that's a little exercise. Now, what's kind of interesting is you can go to options data. Options are people betting on the future prices of stocks, and they're betting to make money. And um, you would guess that they have to be pretty accurate because um, if they bet wrong, they'll lose money, and uh, it'll be the more accurate ones who make money. Well, option prices very accurately follow Black Shoals so accurately that if you were a little bit naive, you'd think that that proves how exact this theory is. But the fact is, most people who buy and sell options use Black Shoals to decide whether the options are fairly priced. So, so um, you, you can have this, this is like the financial uncertainty principle, right? In astronomy, when you observe something, it doesn't change it, but in finance, um, if economists have a Nobel Prize winning theory, it actually can affect market performance. And that's a, a little wrinkle in this field that, uh, that uh, physical sciences don't have to face. Okay, let's turn to portfolio theory. Portfolio theory is about um, what fraction should I hold in every possible investment? So now I'm going to not just hold the S&P 500 in aggregate, I'm gonna decide, should I invest in General Motors? Should I invest in Exxon, which is down 40% during the uh, COVID crisis? Should I invest in, um, I, I should think of some stock that's up because of the COVID um, crisis. NVIDIA, 
because everybody's playing video games at home. NVIDIA stock has gone through the roof. OK, how should I decide what is an optimal portfolio given a bunch of stocks? So let's think about that. We want a bunch of fractions. K is going to range over possible investments. The fractions have to add up to 1. The return that I'm going to make is the weighted average of returns with those fractions. OK. and. Um, um, the excess return of any particular stock is just um, uh, its um, return minus the mean return, which using this, I can write in this way. So with this, let's calculate the expected variance in a portfolio. And that's not a completely trivial calculation. You can write down what you're interested in. You're interested in the expected, that's these angle brackets, value of the um, variance, but it's actually a, um, um, this, the, the, the variance is the square of, of something. And so here I have to write it out once with index K. And here I write, have to write it out again with index M. Anyway, there's some linear algebra here. You know, you pull the sigmas, you pull the sums outside and you move the expectation values inside as far as they can go. And you end up with this result. Um, you end up with the variance of your portfolio <clears throat> is the fractions as a vector, the fractions, the T means transpose, the fractions as a vector. And what's in the middle is the covariance matrix of the individual investments. OK. And now what you want to do is you want to minimize this variance subject to the constraints that the fractions add to one. And it turns out there's a free parameter. You get to specify what return you want. Now that sounds a little odd because it sounds like, well, the stocks will just give you what return they do. But you'll see that when we try to minimize this, we'll fix R and we'll find that some returns are achievable and some returns are not achievable, okay? Um, that will just come out. Uh, and this is now a well-posed problem in convex optimization. In fact, when I do this, we, we were talking before the start about Python. When I do this in Python, I just you know include um, whatever the package is that does convex op optimization and, and don't have to think about it. Um, OK, so in general, the way convex optimization works is, um, and, and here's my picture. OK, I should explain what the axes are in this plot. This is a plot in which for each stock, that's each circle here, I've measured historically what its expected return is and what its expected standard deviation per year is. So I plunk down a bunch of stocks. And now I do this convex optimization to find um, for a fixed, fixing R, the return, what is the minimum value of the standard deviation? And I get a point here. And that is to say, higher values of standard deviation are achievable, but no lower value of standard deviations are achievable. And it's very typical in these convex optimizations that you get a boundary that is, in fact, uh, um, a, a hyperbola um, be, be, because it's a quadratic. So a quadratic, maybe that's the way to say it. OK. And that boundary is, has a name in finance. It's called the efficient frontier. Um, now, it's one of these things where there's an upper one and a lower one, and the lower one is never of interest because we're not trying to get a lower return. We're trying to get a higher return. So really what's of interest is this stretch of the curve. And what that says is some linear combination of these assets gives a portfolio that has a lower volatility and or higher return than any one given asset. OK, and that if you want a single word for that, that would be diversification. 
That's the value of holding assets that, uh, that are not entirely correlated. Now, um, we're not, remember our risk-free investment, that's down here at standard deviation, very close to zero and expected return. Well, when this graph was drawn, it was finite, but maybe it's even very close to zero now. Okay, you can always choose to invest not in these individual stocks, but in treasury bills. And that would give you a straight line here. So in fact, uh, I had some extra, this, this efficient frontier is called the Markowitz efficient frontier. Now I'm where I wanna be. This straight line, um, until you are tangent to the, um, um, to, to this portfolio, uh, I'm, I'm saying it wrong. Um, by a linear combination of this point on the efficient frontier and this risk-free rate, you can put your, your portfolio anywhere along this straight line by just linear interpolation. And then when you get to this point, you could go higher on this curve by leveraging. Remember leveraging, you borrow money to buy stocks. But if you don't wanna leverage, then you're stuck going on this curve, the efficient frontier using stocks only. So that's kind of portfolio theory in a nutshell. And that whole thing is called the CAPM model, the capital asset pricing model. Okay, I'm starting to see myself running out of time. So I wanna figure out what I really wanna tell you about. Markowitz and Sharp won Nobel prizes for this. So did Black and Scholes. Um, here's an actual calculated in Python efficient frontier. I took uh, a set of stocks and some hedge funds here and I downloaded their data and I plugged it into convex optimization. And here the individual assets are these green dots and the efficient frontier you can see lies everywhere above and to the left of them. And that's what you want. That means a higher return at a lower volatility than any individual stock would give you. Okay, so we've done this with a correlational model. Um, and correlational models are at the heart of a lot of financial engineering. And I wanna say something about them. I'm gonna skip this side slide. This sort of is telling you how this beautiful mathematical theory has been sort of boiled down and misstated on popular television shows about stock investing. And it's called Seeking Alpha. And what I'm warning you here is it's a bad idea. You should either, uh, either learn enough to be smart or else just invest in some very safe, uh, mixture of mutual funds, you know, uh, mutual funds and bonds or something like that. Okay. Um, so correlational structure. Um, how do you think about a complicated correlational structure? So interestingly, in the financial community, they make a mess of it, in my humble opinion, as a humble astrophysicist. Um, they have pictures like this, where um, every possible stock in a portfolio against every possible stock in a portfolio, they color code its coefficient of correlation. So of course it's one down the diagonal and you get blocks. These are individual stocks and you can see they have a lot of correlation among themselves. This block are hedge funds, which intentionally adopt strategies to try to not be correlated. And you can see they're relatively uncorrelated with the stocks, I guess that's, that there's not a lot of red here and here and so on. Um, just, just for fun, when I got into this, I uh, tried out a different way of visualizing correlation. And that's to use, um, um, th there's this wonderful thing called the johnson linden strauss lemma, which is a theorem. Okay, I won't explain it other than to say, if you project correlation structure down into small numbers of dimensions, so this is a dimensional reduction technique, um, you get amazingly accurate pictures. Go off and read about Johnson Linden Strauss in Wikipedia. And I was able to make pictures like this where the two dimensional distance um, in this plot is a 
um, good representation of the um, uh, n by n, this whole n by n matrix. And what you see here is lots of things that are very highly correlated. And these are like European stock market, US stock market, um, Japanese stock market. And then you see these hedge funds, which are at big distances because they work hard to try to be uncorrelated for these reasons that you now should understand trying to get a better um, efficient frontier. Um, so um, let's, let's um, talk about why you should learn about correlational models as astrophysicists, because I think they're, they're useful things to understand. And maybe you know this already. Um, suppose you have um, a whole bunch of time series that have some complicated correlational structure. Okay, so you can write their individual measured values as some matrix X, where the um, row index is which time series it is, and the column time series is um, the value of time. Okay, and suppose you have some other um, phenomena that you want to predict based on these things. Well, you do some algebra and you get a formula for a prediction in Y that involves the time series, the collection of time series X. And then these things are um, correlation matrices, which you can calculate using the historical behavior of these series. In other words, you want to predict Y, but you know what Y was to the past, and you can look at what its correlation to the various X's was to the past. And if once you know those correlations, then you can apply this formula. And I'll give an example of this. It's from the financial world. Uh, I should have shown you that. Predicted series, known data, and then these two correlation matrices. Um, I took and downloaded from the web um, the stock prices of 94 small regional banks in the United States. Okay, small is a relative term. These are banks that, that have deposits of a billion or a few billion dollars. That's not like big banks that have trillions of dollars. Okay, and then I picked one of them out of this. I think it's one that's located right in here. You can't quite read the letters. Um, these let abbreviations are which bank it is. I picked the Norwich Bank and Trust Company of somewhere in New York State. And I predicted its daily change from the 93 others without looking at its time series. And this is actual versus predicted. And you can see the correlational model does an amazingly good job. Um, now you can say, well, of course, because it's very highly correlated with, the, with that one right next to it. Well, this uses not just the one right next to it. This uses the second closest and the third closest and the fourth closest, and it weights them in exactly the optimal way to get the best prediction. Okay, so, so that's, that's a concept of big utility that you should use. Now, I, Thomas, how much... I should finish up pretty fast. How fast do you think, Thomas? Let's give it 10 more minutes. Oh, really? Be, re, even with questions? OK, OK. Then I won't, then I'll, thank you. Very generous of you with time. And um, let, let me tell you, this is another paradox, seemingly paradoxical thing, which, which again, I think um, astronomers ought to know about. Um, and that is that stock prices seem to violate the central limit theorem. So what is the central limit theorem? Recall, the central limit theorem says you draw things from some statistical distribution that's not a Gaussian, that's peaked or long-tailed or something, and you add together a bunch of them. And in the limit of adding together more and more, all distributions go over to being Gaussian. And that's used all the time in astrophysics, you know, as the explanation for why a whole bunch of time series and other things look very close to Gaussian because they're the sum of many effects. And it doesn't matter what those are individually because they become Gaussian. Well, 
there are exceptions to the central limit theorem that you probably never heard of. And here's where we can see it. Let's take the distribution of stock prices where I use the daily prices, and that's the blue curve. Now, this is a histogram in which probability density, I've taken the log of probability density. So a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution is a parabola in this plot. And if I normalize these things by their standard deviation, it's always the same parabola. It's the parabola of a Gaussian distribution of unit stand, of zero mean and unit standard deviation. OK, now let's go from daily prices to weekly prices. That means I'm going to add together in each week five daily changes. I'm just literally going to add them to get a weekly change. Then I'm going to go to the next week, add together five. The next week, add together five. Why five? Because there are five weekdays. OK, and then I'm going to look at the weekly changes. And that's the uh, looks to me like it's a purple or brown curve. And we would expect that by the central limit theorem to be going to this parabola. And it's not. It sits almost on top of the blue curve. Well, that's a little striking. What if we go to a month? Then we're adding together, you know, 22 daily changes. And it still doesn't go over to the parabola. And quarterly, it still doesn't. So daily stock prices violate the central limit theorem. But that's a theorem. How can they do that? The theorem assumed that the tails of the distribution decayed faster than, I think it's the fourth power of the deviation. And stock prices don't. OK? Now, surprise, this is a well-known effect. There are probability distributions called stable distributions. Not This is Wikipedia. Wikipedia tells us the most important thing, not to be confused with stationary distributions. A stable distribution is something with this property that if you draw from it and add together the draws, you get the same distribution in violation of the central limit theorem. It does not go over to being Gaussian, no matter how many you add. OK? And there's a whole two-parameter family of them. Um, and um, gosh, when I used to do astrophysics, I used to fit distributions to things all the time. Um, well, um, let me enrich your universe of things to fit to empirical data by the um, technical term is the um, Levy alpha stable distributions. And um, since it's a two parameter family, you'll be able to fit almost anything with this. OK. But what's more important is uh, this, this should come into play when you have a, a time series that seems to violate the central limit theorem. OK, so, so how do mo money managers beat the market, given all of this math and given all of this stuff? Um, and the answer is mostly they don't. And um, at least once a year in any uh, newspaper that has a financial section, they'll with glee report a story that they took all the money managers in a given year who were in the top quartile, and they asked how many of them are in the top quartile the next year. And if it was chance, it would be a quarter of 25, it would be about 6%. And here this shows that they weren't even as good as chance between 2014 and 2015. Okay, and they were even worse between 2015 and 2016. Okay, and by and large, money managers don't beat the market. And that's the argument for investing in index funds that simply invest in the average market and don't try to pick stocks. But there are some managers who do beat the market, and you can find signals of that. And here's kind of an interesting signal. That, that I was interested in because the um, National Academy of Sciences endowment lies in about the middle of this range. And it's that the bigger your endowment is as a university or institution or nonprofit institution, the better you tend to do in your investments. 
I'm like my mouse is doing funny things. Okay, there you are. Uh, how do I go back? Okay, and how how can that be? How can just having a bigger endowment also make you do better? And the answer is um, you can afford and and interest better money managers. And how do they do it? Um, well, there are genuine small market inefficiencies that very fancy money managers uh, can arbitrage. Um, there's um, consistent with what I've shown you, uh, bigger endowments are able to invest in a larger universe of investments. So their efficient frontier is a little more efficient, a little better than a small endowment. But sadly, I think, um, and it's been studied, most of the answer is that uh, they're um, fleecing everybody else. Uh, in other words, every loss is somebody, in, somebody else's gain. And uh, individual investors um, are easily convinced to make bad investments. I keep losing the mouse. There it is. Okay, individual investors make bad investments, and that means someone is gaining from it. It's the money managers of big portfolios. And even institutional um, investment committees um, are uh, often insufficiently quantitative and often much too conservative, and so don't get the maximum of their investment. And that, again, is somebody else's gain. So that's sadly probably the, the main mechanism for making money in the stock market is to find somebody to cheat out of it legally, I hope. Uh, in the case of the National Academy of Sciences, it's of course completely legally and we don't even do that much better. Okay, so, um, so as you've seen, risk modeling is at the, the heart of things. I'm coming to a kind of a summary here. Um, we construct big correlational models Okay, we can use statistics of distributions that are not Gaussian. Uh, we can model the whole thing. Um, and this is basically, if you've heard of rocket scientists who went to work for Wall Street, okay. I have a former PhD student who was very successful doing that. Um, and in particular, a big invention in the financial community was called the Gaussian copula. Okay, I'm not even going to explain that to you. Maybe someone will ask it in a question. But the Gaussian copula became very popular leading up to the year 2008. It was used to value many investments, including notably, it was used to value the, um, the collateral, oh, what are they called? CDOs. Um, anyway, those famous investments that caused the big banks to almost fail in 2008 were all based on this statistical device called the Gaussian copula. Um, and it achieved a lot of notoriety right after 2008. Um, there were many articles in newspapers, the formula that felled Wall Street, the for, I like the formula from hell, something called the Gaussian copula. Okay, so it's not often that there's a piece of pure mathematics that attracts the attention. Um, this was invented by a Canadian financial uh, math whiz named uh, David Lee. Um, and it's been blamed for the great meltdown in 2008. And there's always somebody on the other side. Well, the Economist magazine defended the Gaussian copula. I mean, what can they do? Okay. So uh, I'm at the end now. Uh, this story has a moral. The moral is um, stock market prices are highly non-stationary. So when you measure things to the past, you really don't have as much of a guarantee, any guarantee about the future. Uh, you should beware of predictive models of highly non-stationary phenomena in astrophysics as well as in finance. Um, and if you don't, then I think you, I'm sure you've heard of the Darwin Awards that are, that are awarded jocularly on the internet every year um, to people who do really stupid things. And uh, this is uh, their logo, basically the Darwin Award. So don't do that when you invest. And I guess with that, I will thank you for listening and ask for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. This was really fascinating.
Okay, so let's start with the Q&A. Um, well, there are questions raining in, very good. So are there any questions from the panel members so far? If not, then let's get started yes. with the Oh, a, sh a, Bryce, shocked, yes. a shocked silence. <laughs> Bryce, go ahead. Yes. yes. Uh, hi, Bill. This is uh, Brice Menard from Johns Hopkins University. So um, you presented different uh, types of investors uh, who operate on different scales, you know, 100 million, 1 billion, etc. Is there a scale of which one player would be so big that you know, its actions would completely affect the behavior of the stock market? And if if so, what, what is that scale? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, the, I believe, okay, okay. I have to start by saying, I may no longer be an astrophysicist, but I'm not really a financial person. I'm a, I'm a learner in finance. So take all of my answers approximately. Um, I think most stock trades these days are done by large hedge funds and large banks uh, doing, uh, I, I'm sorry to say this bullet down here that say th th that somebody else's loss is that banks or hedge funds gain. Mm -hmm. um, th those traders l live right at the edge of affecting the market. In other words, if they pull the market too much, they stop being able to make money. But it's clear that they are affecting the market, and it's clear that as a dynamical system, it's not well understood how they are. There's there's a famous event called the flash crash of uh, uh, I'd have to Google to remember the year. Um, I want to say 2008 or 2011 or no, so, anyway, the the flash crash was a 20 minute period in which trading of stocks globally just went crazy with no rationale and it was traced to lines in computer code of these very large traders and uh nobody knows whether that kind of thing can happen again and can it last 20 minutes can it last 20 days nobody knows mm -hmm. let's go to conrad okay thank you Yes, so, so the, the analysis and the derivations you did were based on the stock market. So you also mentioned other investments like options. Um, so do they, these options and also other investments such as, uh, I don't know, uh, real estate or, or something like that, do they actually follow the same patterns and the same rules? Um, so, so lots of economists write papers on that. Um, of course, they love the stock market because there's good data. There, there's good data and lots of it over literally centuries. I mean, people go go back to the Amsterdam stock market in the 1600s. Okay. Um, I, I, I think the answer is, say something like real estate. It, it's it, It's easy to show that diversification into real estate is a good thing to do because real estate obeys like that same postulate. On average, over the very long term, it makes money and it's somewhat uncorrelated with the stock market. Beyond that, whether it follows, you know, a, a uh, levy, uh, stationary distribution and so on like that, uh, I don't think there's enough data to really be able to tell because it's all too specific to location and type of real estate and so on. Um, so the, the universe of well-studied investments certainly includes stocks and bonds and uh, even uh, um, private investments into, in companies. Um, and then after that, I would say the economists attempt to study it, but I wouldn't believe the data. So let's go to uh, the Q&A and there is an interesting, inspiring set of questions about machine learning, right? And I, um, I read some years ago um, an article about exactly that, how to make money on Wall Street most efficiently. And people are actually looking at glitches, right? So um, there is the 
the glitch seek algorithms that sift through all the hedge fund investment strategies and look how they can exploit meta like secondary i don't know derivatives of this entire dynamics um how how do you think machine learning and and you know artificial intelligence in the future will will take this over? Well, there's 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 no question that that you know all of these people in hedge funds, including many former PhDs in astrophysics, um, um, are extremely interested in machine learning. O always have been, even before what we would call you know modern um, deep neural network kind of machine learning. Um, I'll, I'll just anecdotally tell you my experience. So by now, I, I, I know a bunch of economists who, who study th this kind of thing and try to do machine learning using public data and write papers on it. And then I know a bunch of people who work for hedge funds and are you know, former astrophysicists who work for hedge funds who are under non-disclosure agreements and can't tell me anything about what they work on. Mm -hmm. And whenever I nevertheless ask them about some paper by an academic economist using machine learning, they roll their eyes. And what they mean is we are so far ahead of these people, but we can't tell you about it. Um, so so my, my guess is there's a lot of even uh, modern deep neural network uh, um, machine learning being used by the hedge funds um, and completely proprietary. So I hate it, but that's the way it is. Is that a, you think, is that a runaway process at some point? Like what Bryce was mentioning, should there be a limit, right? To like auto destruction well, of the system? <laughs> well, uh, gosh, I mean, it, I'm, I'm a guy who's in favor of government regulation of a lot of things. I, I, I happen to, to, uh, to, to occupy that uh, part of the, of the political spectrum. But um, the, the hedge funds and money managers often lose money in these um, wild irrational events. So it's certainly in their interest collectively not to be causing them. Now, but they don't share data and they don't share algorithms. So whether that leads to a stable or unstable dynamical system, I think unfortunately we're just going to be doing the experiment with with all of our pension savings, by the way. That's what, what they're doing the experiment with. Yes, yes. Okay, so there is, let's go to another Q&A question. Um, so this is maybe a softball here. So um, Pablo Reinhard Giral is asking, would you recommend any book or other resources to get started in computational finance for an astrophysicist? <laughs> um, good question. Um, I, I learned a lot of this stuff from, it, it's a standard textbook by William Sharp. Um, now, I have an edition that's so out of date, um, I guess I won't bother you to, re to Google in real time. Somebody out, Google in real time, it's probably Sharp, S-H-A-R-P-E, and somebody investments. Um, my guess is that if you, go to, if you go to Amazon and Google that and then see people who buy this book also buy other books that you'll, you'll have one. But, but that's a book that's for, um, um, it's not completely mathematical, but it has enough mathematics in it that it'll, that it'll get you started and then you can go from there. Okay, so the next question is from Alvaro Valenzuela. Uh, given that there are correlated prices of stocks, is there any clustering algorithm used to identify them? And as a secondary question, how good or bad does the past behavior predicts the future in essence for stock prices given that? Yeah, 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 both good questions. Um, okay, so so clustering. Okay, so, so, so here's a, a, a lesson I think in astrophysics as well. Um, I'm a believer that you always use all of the data and usually the way this comes in is of try to avoid binning, try to, try to use statistical techniques that use the actual values of each data point, not just the numbers in a bin. I think correspondingly, the 
the correlational model I showed you, rather than trying to cluster or bin things, it uses all of their mutual distances from each other in correlation space. Now, if you insisted on clustering, I could take that matrix of correlations and use any standard clustering technique I want. I mean, I do a, a lot of computational biology now, and the standard thing is to measure genetic similarity and try to infer phylogeny, which is a, a, a clustering, you know, by genus and species and variety. Um, but I'm not sure that the clustering adds anything quantitative that you couldn't have gotten out of the unclustered raw data. Interesting. The next question is from David Koo, and he's asking, does the existence of close to zero or even negative interest rates accelerate wealth inequality since richer entities are able to borrow more, i.e. become richer? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm not qualified to say whether that particular thing um, accelerates it. Um, I, I think that lots of the stuff that I've talked about um, accelerates income inequality. And the question what to do about it without um, collapsing, as, as I say, a very complex financial system, um, which not only makes the rich richer, which I consider bad, but also holds all of our pension and retirement funds and, and, and our futures. Um, that's that's a, the difficult political question. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know what else to say there. Okay, then there is uh, John Mora is asking, uh, can you implement a predictive model for the management of commodity prices? in precious metals, gold, silver, et cetera? Is there something? <laughs> can, can, can I do that? Uh, no. Um, are there hedge funds and money managers that do that? Absolutely, yes. In fact, when I was listing um, the universe of, of uh, investable of assets, I should have, I should have included all, all, all commodities. Uh, um, the, you know, co commodities have, have their own special um you know i was talking i was talking to a guy once his his business was he would buy um f the the cargoes of fishing boats while they were still in mid ocean and then redirect them to not the port they thought they were going to but a port where he thought he could make a little more money and typically, he would never hold the asset even for long enough for the boat to make port. It would steam 500 miles, and that would change the prices enough that he could. Um, OK, but by the way, there's a punchline to this story. He told me he abandoned his business when he discovered that he could make more money trading internet domains than fish. That is spectacular, I have to say. <laughs> That's working the glitches in the system. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go to Giuseppe, and then we go to Conrad. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks Bill, for uh, the overwhelming uh, talk you know, in terms of information. It's not the information to process. I also, this is a very, probably it's a naive question, probably a very brainstorming question, but I was wondering if, well, as an astronomer, I was wondering if, Besides uh, studying correlations and uh, fitting models to data, if there is a way to visualize uh, uh, economic uh, data and in, uh, I don't know, multidimensional uh, spaces or at least two dimensional spaces and study, analyze, it, analyze them uh, as we do like when we measure uh, I don't know, photometry on galaxies, like, uh, or when we do spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. So, so the computer scientists um, and data scientists, of course, look at all kinds of, of ways of doing dimensional reduction. Um, often for visualization, 
um, sometimes for noise reduction because, because the higher dimensions are mostly noise and dimensional reduction pulls out signal. Um, I, don't, I don't think that, that the financial community is ahead of the rest of the scientific world in this. In fact, my experience is that they're a bit behind in, in dimensional reduction per se. I mean, you know, clearly the most quantitative are not behind because they read that literature, but I, I don't think that, that they're doing anything really magically wonderful. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to pick up a question from the, from the question and answers from Errol Simpson who's asking for a 73 year old retiring science educator with half a million pension investment, would you leave it in a pension fund that goes up and down with the market or buy a fixed value annuity? Um, I, I don't think I should be giving you financial <laughs> advice. Um, um, annuity, the, the problem with annuities right now is that interest rates are so low and even expected future equities returns are so low that annuities are very expensive in terms of how much money you have to give the insurance company before they agree to give you money back. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, I guess I feel confident in just saying in the historical record, this doesn't look like a favorable time to buy annuities, but I'm not I don't want to give anybody personal advice about what they should do. But if I just follow up on that, so I think you mentioned it or just said it now that we are in a very special moment now where we have these very low or even negative interests. Do you think that has any special influence on, on how the market and things develop? Um, I, I, I personally do, but my I, in my my talk has tried to be about well-established things. <laughs> so you're asking for my wild speculation. Um, you know, here here we are in the middle of the COVID crisis, and the stock stock market just keeps rising and rising. How are we to understand that? I mean, it it, it had this V-shaped glitch in March and April, but but many parts of the stock market are higher than before COVID. Um, I'm not I'm the only one to suggest, I read in the paper all the time, um, low interest rates let people borrow money almost for nothing. And if, if, you know, if that money ends up uh, fueling stock market speculation, um, then it's a somewhat unstable situation, right? Um, and it doesn't even have to be the same individual borrowing the money as the one who's investing in the stock market. There can be some chain of, of, of events and investments that, that leads to it. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit, per, I'm personally, I'm not giving you expert advice. I'm personally uh, a bit worried about what stock valuations are now. And I personally think that um, holding the interest rates near zero is partly responsible. Okay, Bryce had another question. Yes, uh, Bill. So you, you talked about uh, astrophysicists having numerical tools that are sometimes more advanced or, or as advanced as it gets uh, compared to people uh, working for the stock market. I'd like to know in your experience, how do physicists do in general when they transition from physics to finance? And uh, are they successful? And what, what are their typical challenges? Okay, well, I've I've never made that transition as a full time job, right? But but I but I know I know a number of people who have who have gone gone to work for me, for hedge funds. Um, now, there there was a boom, you know. I I, I talked about um, Gaussian copulas. There was a boom leading up to the financial crisis in which. Um, Anybody with a background in astrophysics or physics could get a job in some big bank. You know, the banks just expanded their things, and many of them did very badly. So that suggests that not everybody was successful in in the mm -hmm. sense of uh, uh, leading their employer to successful investments. But on the other hand, there 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 are hedge fund companies, for example, uh, the Renaissance 
hedge funds, which are available only to institutions um, um, th that have consistently, th th basically their business model is to hire uh, smart mathematicians and scientists and teach them to do finance. And, and they've, they've done very well. Now, at the same time, I have to say, before you all run out and quit, quit astrophysics, I, I talk to a lot of people who they do very well financially in this business, both for themselves and for their employers, but they're not necessarily as happy as when they were doing research in astrophysics. You know, if, if you work in this field, it's just about making money. That's all you're supposed to care about. You know, it's a very one dimensional thing. You can apply all of this, these great mathematical things to making money. Um, in astronomy and astrophysics, we get to do just a lot of more fun things than, uh, than just making money. So um, I, I would say, uh, be careful you know what you want before you try to make a career transition like that. Very good advice, thank you. This is a wonderful stop to wrap it up, I have to say. <laughs> is this a good stopping point? <laughs> this, is, this is wonderful, yes. Okay. Um, so on that note, um, thank you so much, Bill, for sharing your wisdom and, and your time with us. Uh, thank you to all panelists for being with us and asking great questions. And thanks to the audience for tuning in. And um, please fill out the, the survey after the webinar is done. We would really appreciate your feedback. And uh, so I would like to just announce the next talk of the series, which will be on December 12th. Um, so this will be two days before the total solar eclipse. And uh, the golden webinar will be given by Jay Pasahov who will be telling us about his vast experience in observing and studying solar eclipses. So there is uh, then nothing left to say, except for saying thank you very much to everyone again. Stay safe, stay healthy, and until the next golden webinar in astrophysics. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>